Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today we have an exclusive with Ralph Ellis and Michael Tazarian. Good afternoon, gents. Good afternoon, Esoterica. Gents, I'm going to hand it over to you. <laughs> well, thanks Michael, for having us good. on. Yeah, thank you indeed. Yeah, it's good to see Michael again. And we haven't seen each other for a few months. So, yeah, uh, yeah um, I suppose uh, free flowing. How's things uh, with Michael? Oh, fine, fine. Uh, we definitely have to have back on to continue the grail cipher. But in the meantime, you, you, you've done so much more. Uh, on social media, you, you've had some, in, you always, you always engage with people in your work and that's braver than I ever would want to even try to be, but <laughs> give us, before we maybe get into some of the stuff about Egypt and the, your early book, give us a quick press say on what's been happening, not with the Grail Cipher, but later discoveries. There's been several things this year that stand out. We're going to have you on to talk more about it in depth on, on Slave, but just give us maybe, you know, an up to date, so to speak, of this year, where, what's been going on. Uh, I'm not actually writing at present. I've mostly been doing um, uh, promotional work, you might say, because there's no point writing if you don't get the um, message out there and actually, you know, mm. engage with people. And uh, that's been quite productive. I've, I've been quite active on uh, Facebook and uh, my YouTube pages. Uh, I try and engage with people who actually write, you know, serious uh, questions. Um, so, you know, 90% of the questions I normally respond to, and that, uh, no, it's, it's quite intensive, but you get a lot of good feedback, actually. It's, it's, it's nice actually doing that because people ask an awful lot of obscure questions that, you know, are quite pertinent and uh, need answering. So that's good. It, it, it um, gives me more confidence that I know what I'm talking about because I can answer those questions and I, mm. I do answer them. Uh, have a few critics, of course. People out there might have seen, you know, I've had a, a few discussions with some critics. But, uh, I mean, that's good because they're, they're showing me where people don't understand what my books and my thesis is saying. So we have some people who are, you know, serious researchers, but they've misunderstood what I've been actually writing. So they do write uh, critiques that are not entirely correct, and I do have to try and correct them. Um, so that's been taking up a lot of time, but, you know, it's all part of the learning process. Um, so we, we're getting there slowly because I, I've noticed, although they haven't admitted, admitted it, these um, critics are now understanding that Edessa is central to the biblical story. So, you know, without actually admitting that uh, they've adopted this position, suddenly they're all talking about Odessa, which is good because that is central to my story. <laughs> and so right. now we're involving Odessa into the biblical story. And as far as I'm aware, it's never been placed anywhere near the biblical story before. That's um, right. Some of these critics are saying, ah, oh, yes, Eisenman has talked about Odessa before and uh, and there's a couple of books on the history of Odessa out there, but none of those authors have ever insinuated that Odessa was central to the biblical story. And you can imagine how upset they are in one way, because it's all about a narrative as well as a paradigm. And you're part that the bringing in of Odessa and the royal families of Parthia is a paradigm busting, to say the least, isn't it? It, it is, yes, because you're involving a new monarchy that nobody really knew about before because um, I'm not sure if listeners are aware, but Odessa has been deleted from history deliberately. Uh, so the history of this region was written by Josephus Flavius in the AD 70s. And it's quite clear that he was ordered by Vespasian to delete Odessa and delete the Odessa monarchy from history. So they are never mentioned whatsoever in the works of Josephus. And you have to infer their position by looking at what he actually wrote because he deliberately deleted them on numerous occasions. Um, the mm. most obvious of these uh, was uh, the event around Aretas of Petra. This is to do with um, the beheading of John the Baptist. So again, it's you know central to the biblical story. 
Um, because, uh, well, before John the Baptist had his head lopped off, um, this all came about because uh, the daughter of King Aretas was betrothed to Herod Antipas. Um, but Herod Antipas divorced her, or at least got rid of her, sent her home, and married Herodias instead. So, um, sort of thing happens, I suppose, but of course King Aretas of Petra was rather upset by this, so he sent uh, his army up to go and teach uh, Herod Antipas a lesson. And uh, we get two versions of this. We get one from Josephus, which says that um, uh, Aretas had an argument with Herod Antipas, and uh, so he raised an army and prepared for war. And when they had joined battle, all of Herod's army was destroyed by the treachery of some, some fugitives from Syria who joined with Aretas's army. And you've got to think, hold on a minute, you know, Josephus really knows what's going on in first century Judea, so why doesn't he know who these fugitives are who tipped the um, battle into Aretas's favour? Uh, well, it's because he's deliberately deleted them, because he's not allowed to mention them. So um, to, to find out what actually happened, we have to go across to Moses of Karim, and he says of exactly the same event, he says that King Akbar, correction, I'll have to re-pronounce that, King Abgar, having returned to his city of Edessa, allied himself with King Aretas of Petra and gave him some auxiliary troops to make war upon Herod Antipas. And being sharply attacked, Herod's troops were defeated, thanks to the help of the brave Edessans. Mm. Okay, so now we get the truth of the story. So you have to bear in mind that when you're reading Josephus Flavius, he's giving us um, political propaganda more than he is history. He's writing for the Romans, and whatever the Romans want, he will give it to them. And it's quite apparent that uh, Vespasian said to uh, Josephus, never mention Edessa. And that's why he didn't mention Edessa in this particular section. And he calls them fugitives from, from Syria um, because he's not allowed to mention them. But now we are putting Edessa back into this biblical story and people are talking about it, which is great because nobody did before. Um, uh, and taking it well, semi-seriously that they're somehow involved in this story. And they weren't only in Syria when they moved. The story is so fascinating and you tell it in Jesus of Edessa and in other books. What other conquered, what other territories were they, their people in as opposed to Syria? What about Palestine? What about Judea? You know, where did they set up shop a couple of places? Yeah, um, essentially, they were trying to take over the region. So they were given uh, Edessa by um, Octavian and Herod uh, Archelaus. So this was in about AD 4, roughly. Um, they were given that territory by them because they were kicked out of Parthia. So Parthia didn't want them. They were the monarchs, uh, the royalty of Parthia. They were kicked out of Parthia. And they were given these lands in the east of Syria, that's Edessa, tax-free by Octavian, Augustus, uh, in order to act as a sort of buffer state between Rome and Parthia, because Rome and Parthia have been at odds with each other for you know, more than a century. And so they were given these lands tax-free if they acted as some sort of buffer state between the two major superpowers, uh, which they did. But they expanded out and they, their territory went all the way down through Haran, which is just below Edessa, all the way down to Petra. So I say Petra was a part of their principality um, because Petra suddenly grew from almost nothing to being a, one of the richest um, cities in the whole of the Roman Empire in the first century. And there's no good reason why that should have happened. I've just been reading um, the authoritative um, history of, of um, uh, Palmyra. Sorry, did I say Petra? I meant Palmyra. Oh. Um, yeah, Palmyra, which is just to the east of uh, Damascus. And uh, yeah, in this, uh, 
this very, very thick book about the history of Palmyra. Uh, they don't know why it suddenly turned from being a very small oasis town into being one of the biggest uh, cities in the Roman Empire uh. in the first century. And I say it's because they were established by the Edessan monarchy who were very rich and they wanted to take over this region. And so they, um, they boosted Palmyra as being one of their uh, big cities in their principality, gave it lots of money and they wanted people to come in. And it, it's quite apparent that they had people come in from all over the, the uh, local area to live in Palmyra yeah. because there were jobs there, there was wages there, uh, there was a good life to be had there, there was riches there, and it became a huge great um, city mm. to the uh, east of um, Damascus. But uh, they wanted to spread out a little bit further, so they had this narrow strip of land, went from Edessa all the way down to uh, Palmyra. Mm. And in the AD 40s, come 50s, they wanted to take over Judea. And they did. Mm. And they did so by spreading money around again. It's always a good way of taking over a region. So the Queen of Edessa, who was called Queen Helena, went down to uh, Judea in a time of famine and started spreading money around. And she bought grain from Egypt and she bought uh, figs from uh, Cyprus and she fed the people of Judea in their time of need. And I say this was in about AD 50. And she became the queen, queen of Judea. She became the queen of the Jews because she was a Jew. She was a Nazarene Jew, the same sect as Jesus. The fourth sect. And yeah, because uh, Jesus was a Nazarene, of course. Yeah. And uh, so she became the queen of Judea and she had the largest palace and the largest tomb in Jerusalem, uh, which, which are both still there. In fact, they're mm. still uncovering the uh, palace uh, just below the uh, Temple Mount uh, in Jerusalem now. So you can go exactly. and see it. So a very important female uh, matriarch. Yeah. Did they... they as you mentioned Petra, let's just touch on that a minute, because if there was a connection to Petra, uh, you can clear that up in a minute, but then there would have been the Nabataean connection, which connects us with the Herods again, doesn't it? Yeah, no, I don't think they, I, I said uh, Petra by mistake, I okay. Almira. But okay. there was a connection there because of course the Edessans were allied with King Aretas of Petra ah. um, in that battle against uh, Herod Antipas. So oh, I see. They did have an alliance between each other. Um, uh, so between them, they, they covered the whole of the eastern board of the Roman Empire, all the way, you know, down past Judea, down towards Petra. So and you've, ex they, oh, you've explored also a lot to do with Cleopatra. So let's take it from just where you left off. By the time they're taking over Judea, and probably even before that time, you're going to have these weddings, marriages, alliances. Like you said, some of them go wrong and armies are sent to, you know, in chagrin. But a lot of them are going to work. Talk about when this Edessan group get in, what would be one or two of their great conquests in terms of a, a favorable marriage with somebody in the local region? You said they converted to Judaism, but maybe expand upon that with their alliances when they got there. Yes, well, there is, um, there is a tentative alliance with uh, Egypt. One of the Ptolemy uh, sons of Egypt is supposed to have married into this uh, royal family. Uh, that's tentative because we don't have much information on it. Um, certainly they had marital links uh, with the other kings of this region because there, there were a few kings uh, in the east which Rome were happy to use as client kings. Uh, so there was uh, kings of Komen and uh, Emesa. I must actually investigate the Emesan kings uh, a little more because they maybe central to this, I don't know. Um, but we have this place called Edessa, which is up in the north of Syria. But then it's sort of in the middle of Syria, we have this kingdom called Emesa. Very similar name, different kingdom. And I don't know their relation to the Edessans, but they are obviously uh, closely linked. Um, they're around the Damascus and Homs region. 
and they, I think, are important because sons of that region became emperors in the second, third century. So when we come to uh, Emperor Elagabalus, he was of the Emesan royal family. And right. I think there is a definite link there between Edessa and Emesa, mm. which needs exploring a little bit more. Um, and you, King Jesus is where you go in to, you hone in on that particular monarch, don't you? That's really in my Jesus King of Edessa book. Right. So the King Jesus book, I'd never heard actually of Edessa at that time. Uh -huh. So that was just the links from the gospel story and the Talmud story about the Jewish revolt and the links between the Jewish revolt <clears throat> and the biblical story, the gospel story. Of course, the Grail, the, the, the Grail stone, at least, would tie in here because that, that monarch and the House of Emesa, this is, there's a connection to that I, uh, icon, isn't there? Yes, the Grail stone is linked to both Edessa and Emesa. So this is why I think I must go into Emesa and look at it more deeply. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this, the Grail stone uh, was known as the Omphalos, uh, and it was originally in Greece. Well, originally it was in Egypt, but many, many centuries ago, it, it went from Egypt um, to, um, to Delphi in Greece. And it was the sacred stone of, of Greece. But then it yeah. sort of disappeared over to Parthia because it went with Alexander the Great. And it appears to have gone to Parthia because we have all of these coins from Parthia with the Omphala stone actually on it. Yeah, is that it's phallic, uh, and isn't there a sort of a lattice? Correct me if I'm wrong around it. Yes. We still don't know what this lattice is. In yeah. in the Greek coinage, it's covered in netting. Yeah. And we don't know the significance of this netting nor what it's made of. The copy of this stone, which is still at Delphi, seems to have shells. So the netting is made up of shells. And I couldn't see any reason for the shells being on it. So I wondered if these, these um, items were actually uh, stars on it, something cosmic instead of being mm. shells. But anyway, you have this strange netting that covers it. And it's obviously separate to the stone because on some of the coins, the netting spreads out on the floor below the stone. So Almost like a checkered floor. Uh, no, it's more like a, a some sort of netting, mm. uh, almost like a fisherman's net, but it's made of, it looks like it's made of shells or something. Well, the it's net, strange. the net, it's it's very similar to things that turn up in stone, uh, in Newgrange on the so solar stone there, the sunstone at the door, and on some of the other base stones, you get this sort of grid netting effect. The only connection I've made to it, we're having a guest on soon who uh, is going to talk about it in maybe two, three weeks. Uh, the, the net was the one of the symbols of the god Orpheus. He was the fisherman, and he was known in different cultures as Dis, D I S, the god of the underworld. But you never just have one appellation or one attribution to these gods that, because of the cultic nature, right? They, they're they're under different names in different places. And he was the great net caster. Hades is a version of Dis, in the fisherman of souls. Uh, Orpheus, you know, would throw the net out to. To to uh, I don't know you know to net the souls you get this motif with the Jesus figure as well as as, as that kind of a savior of souls and you get the fish so the net which you find on Masonic lodges architecture to me that's the only strong connection mm -hmm. uh, that that you could think of is this god of the underworld Plut Pluto or whatever there, there there is another connection uh, and actually I've not written about this but there is another connection in that the the, um, the pillars of Yakin and Boaz. Uh, from the Temple of Solomon were surmounted by the sphere of the earth and the sphere of the cosmos. And both of them were covered in nets. And you can see That's that right. in some of the imagery. When you look at the imagery of uh, the two pillars, Yakin and Boaz, you will see nets covering the sphere of the earth and covering the sphere of the cosmos. Could be a Gnostic item then. Yeah, is it? well, I, I wonder exactly what that net is. Are they looking at this net as the, mm, the latitudes and longitudes of the cosmos? 
So if you look at the sky and you actually draw it on a map, you will draw latitudes and longitudes and it will form a net across the cosmos because that's how you draw the cosmos. Mm. And I wonder if that's what they mean by netting because this netting actually appears in the Old Testament. If you look at the description of Yakin and Boaz, it says that there are nettings that go across the two of them. So that's, right. that's why when you see uh, images of these pillars, they're always covered in nets. And it's very, very similar to what the Greeks were portraying for the Omphala stone. Yeah. And of course, the Omphala stone was cosmic. It was supposed to be a meteorite. It was supposed to have been, as it were, a piece of the sun that broke off and fell to earth, you know, this fiery lump of rock. So it was a part of the cosmos itself. Yeah, the, there's certain, well, Net is an Egyptian goddess, although the vials can alter, of course, there could be, but this thing is very phallic, so what, what's it doing? People think in terms of phallus has nothing then to do with the goddess tradition, but that's completely bogus because merely looking at the Shiva cults and the Lingam cults of India completely shows you how, mu how, mu how much a role women do play in the whole anointing of the phallic uh, and all of that. So women are very much involved in phallic cults in, in well, numerous the, ways. The stone the stone itself was uh, andro androgynous, you might call it. Yeah. It was both phallic and it was an egg because it's phallic because it's a, um, a conical piece of stone. But it's, That's in a, right. it's in a setting. And normally, if you bring it out of the setting, you see the bottom of it is curved and therefore it's an egg. Yeah. So it's both phallus and egg. It's like um, the uh, Indian lingams. If you see a lingam, it's yeah. it's a phallic stone but if you take it out of its socket it's actually an egg yes i've seen some of those They're even like the kaaba you know there's a certain shape of the opening like you get uh and one that one feminist writer in a book called reign of the phallus actually pointed out that the cervix when you're not looking too closely can look it can double up as a, as a phallus so there's a very as you say the androgynous hermaphroditic aspect and i'm sure that this was big in the cults Oh, it Not was, just yeah. The, the this, primeval Adam was supposed yeah. to be, well, he was supposed to be hermaphrodite, but I think androgynous as well. Um, mm. The primeval Adam was, was the primary demiurge, I suppose you would call him, of the uh, Nazarene. So the Nazarene actually believed in the primeval Adam, oh. uh, which was an androgynous uh, god. He was neither male nor female. Well, and, I know that. Um, oh no, go ahead. Finish that. Uh, well, yeah, just as just as a thought on that, because we don't know who the primeval Adam was, but it's sort of linked into my previous books, where the original um, ori um, origins of this uh, cult go back to uh, Pharaoh Akhenaten, and of course Akhenaten was always displayed as being androgynous so he was neither male nor female he had female aspects uh in his you know slight bust um wide hips mm -hmm. and he had no genitalia so in, in some respects he was the primeval adam as as venerated by the nazarene and so depicted wonder, depicted do, like that yeah i do wonder if it goes back to him and remember, the ancient Egyptians did have a god called Atum, A-T-U-M. Yes. That could have been the, the basis of the Adam. Uh, and then the net, C.S. Lewis always points out that the medieval worldview, and of course the medieval worldview was a very static worldview based on a lot of earlier cosmo cosmo cosmogenies or whatever you want to call it. And there was the idea of the mundane and the super mundane and the sort of a wall or a net or some kind of veil that stood between the sublunar and the lunar maybe are you familiar with that no not too much no um i don't know yeah, if you can explain a bit more no i can't remember yeah except the fact that uh, as a christian thinker he was always talking about this a medieval worldview and he knew all you know in some of his great works he always spoke about the dividing of the heavens into the lunar and the sublunar and that the, the, the planet we're on Earth is called uh, Thul Kandra, the silent planet. So when you talk about those two pillars, which of course are definitely phallic, ithyphallic from some other cultic phallic cult, but the fact that there's a net cast over them, that made, just made me think of that. So again, there's nothing to be certain about, just Lewis's remarks about 
that then this planet is different than the other ones in the solar system because it was called the silent planet in which whatever we would call a, the Satan or the adversary basically owned this planet and the others in this uh, spiritual sense were not you know controlled and so when you have those angel symbols of the seraphim and the the cherubim you know where they're on the wheels the wheels are often represent the, the planets because a planet was never symbolized just by a planet but it was its orbit you know as a wheel mm -hmm. the orbit of a planet was to them a great wheel in the sky in which the planet was just sort of the nub or the center or a jewel or some sort of thing and so these seraphim and cherubim on the wheels were the ones who represented the nine or ten different planets but the earth was dark and it just made me feel that uh, you know maybe the net was the symbolism that that's a symbol that they used to say these realms are cut off the problem of good and evil is a you know and then the, think of the twin pillars being black and white or it seems to be this dualism that we're captured in but you know this way my mind works i don't want to get into all of that but it's there one has to be very uh because even in your work as you say a thing that jumped out to me years ago when your first writings is about pesher and about gematria and about that you and you, you might have to even you might be meeting critics today who haven't quite got that where that if you're reading the Talmud, if you're reading the Bible, uh, my God, you just cannot take it literally, no matter what, you know, of course they play with you. Sometimes it is bone literal, but as you said, Josephus is, is a, more of a myth monger. He's not quite, he's under direction to not tell you as much as he wants to tell you. And this is the same with a lot of historians, even Herodotus. So talk a little bit maybe about that of your history, your work, your uh, sort of a, uh, need or reliance on realizing that keeping that always in your mind that the hebrew language you know the, the aramaic language and then moving into the greek and roman they're they're not telling you straight are they Talk, you know, maybe people haven't heard about pesher there's a certain code breaking aspect to this isn't there very much so um they were wordsmiths and they were very proud of their profession and so they they just loved having in jokes um, so everything was a play on words, even within the biblical text, there's loads of plays on words, um, especially where there was something that was not entirely mentionable. So when Queen uh, Maka was um, uh, worshipping or venerating an idol, um, in the Aramaic, I can't even pronounce it, um, but there's a play on words because it sounds like an erect penis and of course I, I didn't quite know what that meant so I looked at it in the Latin Vulgate and again they just call it a Priapus so unless you know your Roman history you wouldn't know what they're talking about but again a Priapus is, is a phallus um, and so they were always doing that to cover up what they were, were saying and they were using Pesha which is a way of prophecy so you look at events in the past uh, so you trawl through the Old Testament and looking for similarities with current events. So you're looking for a similar character who has a similar life to someone in the present. So if you're looking for a Jesus character, you might look back into the Old Testament and you might find Balaam or Elijah. And OK, that's a sort of similar character. So now we can use that character to... Uh, foretell the future use it for prophecy you know what happened in the past might happen in the future but i think more importantly than than just prophecy you can also use it to cover up who you're talking about so yeah yeah that was important because especially with the talmud they were writing this in the first century to the fourth century and they either had the romans looking over their shoulders or they had the christians looking over their shoulders and they didn't want to get into trouble with either of them because the Jesus character was taboo in Rome. And we, we can go through that, but uh, very much he was taboo. And then the real historical Jesus character was taboo for uh, the Catholic Church. You couldn't mention him and his, his real true life, but you could mention Balaam and you could mention uh, Elijah. And so you could talk all day about these two characters and nobody would be any the wiser what you're talking about. Yeah. So it's, it's a great way of covering things up within the Talmud. And unless you know who these characters are in the Talmud, uh, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. So yeah. there's a great deal of that all the time you're looking at wordplay 
and some is some of it's just because you know they're being silly that mm. it's, it's just humorous you know because they think it's funny well, um, two things are two things yeah. that jumped to mind about that is the jews have a long history as host, as guests in other people's countries like the persians the assyrians the babylons and even the egyptians so this may be it's a it's a very fertile uh, route of discovery to say where did they get that because then you're heading to egypt uh, people who had a very highly sophisticated hierograms hieroglyphics we would know them as but had an incredible right history of just this symbolic uh renditions isn't it uh, it, it wasn't something probably the jews just discovered on their own this is this has a whole history that ties into astro theology and many other cults going back to i mean who was it jrs mead said that when you really read what's in Egypt, the priests are always telling you, we are but the later version of even greater elders. He's not the only one who quoted that. The thing is just unbelievable, isn't it, when you get back into the deep histories? Yeah, and they didn't always know what they were talking about. And so, yes, they would have illustrative uh, uh, ways of talking about it, like we were talking about the, the, the two great wheels, uh, which is common in, in many cultures. Uh, the Greeks talk about the two great wheels of the cosmos. Uh, and even Arthurian legend has, has uh, Arthur's cosmic cart with the two great wheels of the cart turning in the cosmos above. And of course, the, the two great wheels of the cosmos are the uh, celestial wheel, or the celestial sphere, and the ecliptic. And if you look at the stars, the way they rotate around, yeah, you've got two big wheels in the in the heavens above and they turn at different rates okay you know the celestial wheel goes round once a day and then the ecliptic wheel goes round once every 26,000 years but they both rotate in the heavens above you've got these two giant wheels so it's, it's very descriptive but unless you knew what they were talking about you could be very confused yeah yeah and isn't it on those masonic pillars one is the celestial sphere uh, just yeah, as you're saying yeah, one is celestial and one is the earth. So in, in a way, that's, <laughs> yes, in a way, that's the same, isn't it? Um, yeah. And yeah, remember, if people find it difficult to understand this aspect of the coding, think of a later artist like William Blake, who was able to understand the pressure. So then he reprises Jesus yet again, and Elijah and Job. He's doing exactly the same thing in a much more modern era, although to us it looks like 200 years ago. No, in biblical terms, this is a man who, understanding this pressure, not only uses it but then even adapts it yet again so it's not just something old and dusty it's part of a form of communication that's still very much alive uh, and you can recast and rescript mary or you know uh, uh, and i was i was think of him i was doing that uh, in this incredible coding and decoding and this, uh, allusions to figures that have an enormous symbolism uh, the lion for instance you know yeah um uh, yeah blake does that especially with his very famous image of the two naked characters, one of whom is called Loz, um, and between them is Stonehenge and, and, and whatever, and he's carrying the hammer and whatever. If you look at that, it, on the surface, it, do, it doesn't make much sense, but it's actually a first degree Masonic tracing board. And the two characters are replacing the two uh, pillars of Yakin and Boaz. So instead of having two pillars, oh, he has wow. two characters. And one is loss. And of course, if you if you turn that around, you get soul. So one oh. is the sun, the other is the moon. It's it's a first degree tracing board from you know standard Masonic laws. Extraordinary. But he's presented it in such a strange fashion that you, you would never really know about it until you know you actually see one. That's right. And he made Jerusalem, you know, as the, did these feet in ancient times walk on England's pastor's green. Jerusalem is actually a woman. Try, 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 try that for size, an iconographic uh, alteration, and yet still consistent on the esoteric level. But if you don't possess the esoteric key, well, it's exoteric, and that's the end of that. It's just a nice story. You might as well just tell kids at bedtime or something, and whole nations just think he was. You know, we imagine that these kinds of people worked on this very literalistic level. Then when you go to the Bible, you find that you must end up. You have to concede. And I think a lot of the blockheads, even if they have very, very high degrees, this is a restricted aspect. They are, they're going to fight it or they're going to say, no, there is such a coding, but my interpretation of the coding is is better than everybody else. So, you know, they might try to own it or uh, uh, copyright it. But think of even your clear. 
remember your Cleopatra illusions that the Seb and the number seven and the number the star. So this are, these are atmistic symbols. They're astrological symbols, and sometimes they were held very dearly, weren't they? In the sense of the star, this this word that turns up in the Essenes to represent a master. It turns up in the Gnostics, and it turns up in these other cults as well. And the number seven, right? These are all decodable. Yeah. Yeah, and, and just quickly before I go on to that, going back to Blake again with his uh, And Did Those Feet. Uh, of course, it's just a nice song. Well, in, in England, it's more than a nice song. It's the national anthem. And so the national anthem of England says that Jesus was in England. And again, he's harking That's back right. to a very, very old tradition that Jesus actually came to Britain, uh, to England as... Uh, well as it sort of was in in roman times um yes and did those feet in ancient times walk upon england's mountains green uh it's the tradition that jesus was exiled to what was then britain uh in ad 70 there's an old tradition that goes back through masonic because blake was a mason of course he understood these things that's right and so he picked up on this old tradition that uh, not just Joseph of Arimathea was uh, exiled to Britain, but so too was Jesus in ancient times. In his company, yeah, the, the, the British Israelites have accepted that yep. and studied that. Even on in terms of physical buildings, as you have done, your work goes far deeper than theirs actually, but even before you existed, there was this, as you know, the group that uh, absolutely took those things literally, went to Tintagel and tried to, to, to go to Glastonbury and put the pieces together. I don't think they ever achieved it. I think you, your work is distinctive like that. Uh, you have several books on that, uh, which, which is, because you know, I was interested in that. The two things that really got me into your work was that, the British Israelite complication of did Jesus come or not and in what form and in what way, trying to put that together. And then this one about, uh, we nearly touched on it with the Herods actually had land in France. And therefore, when we talked about the conquest of Judea and Edessa, possibly Emesa, but wait a minute, what's happening out here where these families, Mary ends up in Europe, for goodness sake. <laughs> One is that Jesus is arrested and deported there, but there's also this movement to France, which changed not only French history, but Dutch history to English history. We'd need hours to go into it. But there is this incredible connection because the Herods own the land in France. This is not just one little mm. Middle Eastern family. These are tremendous power brokers in the world that Mary went to, isn't it? Yeah, Herod Archelaus was actually exiled to France and he lived in the south of France. Uh, and then, of course, we have the tradition that Mary got sent there as well. Uh, so she, uh, this would have been after the Jewish revolt. This would have been sort of AD 71, something of that nature. And if if I'm correct, and she was Mary Bothus, um, which uh, not just myself, but you know, Professor Robert Eisenman has said that uh, you know Mary Magdalene was Mary Bothus. Uh, she was the richest woman in Judea in the AD 650s and 60s. But we have this rather tragic um, tale from Yohanan ben Zakkai, who was the he was the rabbi who controlled Judaism after the Jewish revolt. So he obviously was a very pro-Roman. He had to be pro-Roman because he was working for the Romans. He was the guy who invented what we know today as uh, rabbinic um, Judaism, who ended, you know, the uh, uh, roast sacrifice and all of that business. And a lot of what's in the uh, Talmud is actually written by this guy, Yohanan ben Zakkai. And he has this story about after the Jewish revolt, meeting Mary, Mary Bothus Magdalene, um, who had been the richest woman in Judea. And he's saying, because she's out on the streets picking barley corns from the ground. And he says, Mary, what's happened to your great wealth of your family? And, and they have this little, um, uh, little discussion between each other but it's apparent that now she is destitute she's lost all her money and yeah the the um the mythology picks up on her being then exiled to france and it's quite a strong mythology i mean there's not a great deal of information to back it up but when you go down into the south of france you see an awful lot of this mythology has sort of rubbed itself off on the region that's and right you see traces of of uh, this mythology 
in all of the towns you go to. And, it, and I sort of traced it to a slightly different position. So a lot of people take her down towards Aix, which is one of the big towns in the south there in Provence. Uh, we have all of these stories about, um, you know, from the Soigneur Society and all of this sort of business talking about those two famous uh, towns in the south of France. But I took it up to Orange and thought she might have gone to Orange because Martha is said to have gone to Tarascon, which is the next town further up, further north. And where Martha, this is Martha of Bethany from the Bethany sisters, is supposed to have gone to uh, Tarascon where she uh, tamed the Tarasque, which is this fearsome monster in Tarasque. But if you look at it, it's just a huge armadillo. Um, they had these um, enormous great armadillos back in, uh, actually, I don't know when they existed, up to a few million years ago anyway, they had these enormous ar armadillos, which were about two or three meters long. Sure. Um, and you can still find them occasionally, you know, people poking around in boglands uh, quite often find the remains of these enormous great animals. But anyway, the Tarasque is, is one of these huge great animals. It's a big um, armadillo. Um, yeah. And well, I remember, think Mary went to Orange, possibly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, that, you, your book, Mary Magdalene, is my favorite. Everybody should read it. Uh, I want to get to the star on her flag in a minute to take it in the direction of astrotheology again. But just a point that people may not understand, and that is her presence down there or any of that group. This is not just uh, important in terms of uh, biblical history and the movements of the real Jesus. But it also turns up in romances because you've worked in the Grail cipher. The connection there would be the troubadour. This is why I said got me interested in because I was looking for what that's all about. You know, through other writers' years in the eighties and all, couldn't make sense of it. What is this chivalric uh, troubadour courtly love? I'm reading your work and I'm going, oh my God, there it is. You know, after how many years, right? So. You, I, you can imagine after 25, maybe longer years of being into that tradition, and then there's a tie into the Arthurian legends because you don't get a tra you don't get a chivalric tradition or a troubadour tradition without the great Grail, si Grail writers like Wilfram von Eisenbach and, and the whole rest of them, Christian de Troyes. So the tie in here is also, in, we don't have the time to talk about it incidentally, but this Mary cult, so to speak, gives rise to a lot more of French mythology and French history, French uh, culture than people would even imagine. You know, you've, you've brought so much to bear on that as well. But let's let's go into this idea of her tutelary symbols. On the, on the French diadems, as you say, when you go to these places, you find the star. Now, the word Sheba or Seba means seven, doesn't it? And related to a star. So here is your so astrotheological symbols. We don't even need to talk about the sun. I mean, Akhenaten and the sun, they're almost synonymous. But there's this other stellar sidereal component, and it comes out again in France with the use of the star that was picked up by the Masons. They all have it on their flags. The Orange Lodge in Ireland does, uh, the, the Black Preceptory. They all use this either purple star or the, uh, William de Gallone, right, was I think the first to use it in terms of France. Uh, and he, yeah, there's the Jewish connection. It's throughout all of this history in a way, yeah. because uh, I mean, we have the Queen of Sheba, and of course, Sheba in Egyptian means the star. Um, and then when we go through into Aramaic, it has uh, similar connotations. So in Aramaic, yeah, it means number seven. And it also means the Sabbath. And of course, the Sabbath is the seventh day. And I had this argument with um, a rabbi who said Sabbath has nothing to do with the number seven, but it's a Sabbath and Saba, Sheba or Saba means the number seven. It's the seventh day but somehow that's not connected to the Sabbath. Anyway, um, and it's the day of the star, whereas we say it's the day of the sun, Sunday, um, but theirs, it's the day of the star. Um, yeah, the star is central to this, and it's normally, I think actually it's not a star. I think normally it's um, Venus, it's uh, Aphrodite, um, because uh, Isis was the star. Yeah. She is linked to the moon, of course. She is the female. Uh, deity as opposed to the sun so we have the sun and the moon but she was also linked strongly to Venus and of course uh, in Egyptian her name was Ast 
uh, rather than Isis. So she was called Ast, and from Ast we get Astarte, Astarte, Ashtoreth, and then her name changes in the Greek and she becomes Aphrodite. And that confused me for a while because it didn't seem very um, cosmic because all of these characters and names are all cosmic. It's all to do with uh, astrotheology, as you know, one of your favorite subjects. Um, and yet uh, Aphrodite didn't seem to be very astronomical to me. It means the foam of the scene. But then I started thinking about this in terms of the cosmos. What is the foam of the sea in the cosmos? It's the Milky Way. And so what, what they're saying is she was born, Venus was born in the Milky Way. And there's only a few times of the year when Venus is actually superimposed upon the Milky Way. Uh, and so effectively, you've got some sort of dating method. I didn't finally work out exactly what that dating method uh, was supposed to give us, but it gives us a couple of months in the year when Venus runs through the Milky Way. Hmm. So, yeah, that's running through into the south of France. Yeah, they have this uh, star symbolism again. Um, the lone star was the symbol of uh, uh, Guillaume de Galone, as he was known, William of Galone, uh, who was William of Orange. He, he was William of Orange. This is a very early William of Orange. Even the Dutch, because I lived in Holland for quite some time, and the Dutch didn't know this history either, which I found very strange. It wasn't taught in their schools that the Dutch were not Dutch. They came from France. They came yeah. from Orange in France. And that's why the uh, Princes of Orange in Holland are called the Princes of Orange. Yeah. They're named after the town in the south of France called Orange. Um, and yeah, that, the, the guy who set up that, um, that principality, because it was entirely separate from the rest of France, was William, Guillaume yeah. uh, de Gallone. The hook and nose. we have this great long, as you were saying, the, the troubadours of France, we have this great long story, the, uh, the story of William uh, Guillaume de Gallone. And it tells this whole story about this family who set up this uh, principality. Uh, and in my um, estimation of it, it's links with Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing after I'd read all of this and written about this is I found out that this book, this uh, Troubadour's Song, was written by Wolfram van Eschenbach. So the very same guy who wrote about Arthurian legend was also writing about these um, people down in the south of France. Yep, amazing. Part of the same story, almost. Part of the same story. In which the Holy Grail also turns up, the whole cast of characters is back. Again, different wine, uh, same wine and different bottles. Yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> there is a... There is a conversion later as they move to Holland. Of course, the famous one people would know is the one they transform from Catholics to Protestants. As far as that goes, uh, we could have a whole argument about that. And then finally, the Dutch royal families with the more familiar William of Orange moving over to where? Britain to depose the King James there and then set up what everybody knows as the British monarchy, uh, which of and course affects Irish history enormously, enormously there. And then, so- and They're all ginger, of course. <laughs> Up even to this very day. <laughs> and of course, it is at this point then, say somebody knew nothing about masonry, at least this is conceded by masons themselves and certainly on their iconography, that at this point, merely from a symbolic level, whether you like masons or you don't, just they are preserving some of, if not all, then some of these uh, motifs, the movement, the symbolism, the female, uh, it, it's all there to be understood. Uh, all the different motifs that might have spanned centuries going even back to Egypt, like the blazing star. You can see it on the outside of Masonic lodges. You don't even have to even go inside. Or the great geometry, as you said, the two pillars, the, the uh, blazing star, the symbol of the G, and then the uh, diadem of the compass and protractors, etc. So it's loaded with Templar symbolism. And this would then take somebody as, as I did, as I tracked all of this, you know, to the Templar connection, because were they then, William de Galone, did he have a, a Templar body that then became, you know, the famous Merovingians who became the bodyguard of Mary and her progeny and so on. So there's a tie-in to the famous 
holy blood uh, motifs that you have explained, I think, far better than any of those writers. In fact, they sometimes career careen off into areas that uh, mm, don't quite make a lot of sense. Uh, your work holds together in a much more grounded historical and scientific way, actually. And it's certainly essential to anyone who wants to know more about that Mary bloodline uh, story of Jesus and the French connection in the sense of René Le Chateau, that whole mystery. Your work does, Mary Magdalene would be the book there to start with. It's my favorite book of any of you. Well, I mean, that's a, you know, how, how do you say which one is favorite? But I, to me, it just, because it answered so much. But coming back to, uh, if I was to recommend, and because we're running out of time as well, but I would recommend your latest book, Jesus of Edessa, to anyone who wanted to get the scope. And you can work back from that book, actually. You can start with the end book, you because know, I was thinking that I've read all your works, but I was always thinking about, hey, if I was to, which I do actually physically do recommend your works to people. And I was thinking, oh my God, shall they start with Jesus, you know, King Jesus or something earlier or, or uh, Skoda, the queen of the, the, the Scots and all this. But I think actually Jesus of Edessa is the one I would recommend. I don't know if you agree. And then they can work their way back, but it, all the previous works will make, will be relevant. They will not be like different in that sense to throw somebody. They will actually be very, very, coherent by reading the last book first, so to speak. I don't know if you ever recommend that yourself. I, I do, because it's the, the meat of the whole subject. And, you know, that's the, the culmination of all of the rest of them. Um, and very nicely, it, it does tie in with all of the other books, because, of course, I didn't know anything about of Edessa when I was writing the other books. This all led up to the discovery of Edessa. Um, even the Odessa book wasn't called Odessa when I wrote it. It was called Queen Helena because that's what the book was about. Yeah. And it wasn't until halfway through that book that I even discovered this town of Odessa. And that's one of the things I like about my research is that it ties into the previous books that I've already written. And so it didn't change any of the story I had already written in the previous books, like yeah. know, King Jesus or... Um, Cleopatra to Christ, it actually confirmed what I'd written previously. Because in the, even in the um, Cleopatra <laughs> to Christ book, I have this monarchy being thrown out of Parthia and ending up somewhere in northern Syria on the eastern boards of um, Syria. But I didn't know where because I'd never found this town before. And it wasn't until two books later that I suddenly found out where they actually went to yeah and yep. they actually went to odessa and set up this new principality in the eastern uh, half of uh, syria um, that would be odessa and palmyra um, the great uh, city in the desert now so, they've made they've made uh, very poor documentaries for 20 30 40 years on some of this material and we've had those piecemeal your book there could make a not only one documentary but a series so uh that's why also when i'm reading it, it's so visual it's it's almost like a fictional story it's it's really is like a, a cecil bill de mill movie like a cleopatra in that sense but you also know you're getting the truth because remember you also speak a great deal about the history of armenia so it's not limited to uh, one little or you one, which is what you get with other people's books i've read them all uh, and it's fascinating but it doesn't quite have the scope uh, that uh, that last book and then even King Jesus has because you're moving from the west from Britain so, say take King Jesus but even the last one this is a sweeping story that goes from Parthia I mean you're even talking about the Atnas of Egypt I do want to end this program on one anecdote about that but then it moves through as you say from the Parthians who are they well I don't even know where Parthia is what's that are they Persians here? so you're telling a story and then you go down to the Jewish connection which is to me absolutely monumental because this family actually does then marry into Jewish traditions and what's that because there's a big difference between upper elite aristocratic or merchant Jews who have an esoteric Kabbalistic attitude towards life very similar to Egypt in fact very similar if the people have read your work and then then as I say it goes into explaining more of the familiar Greek and Roman and then even in the British system so this is a very comprehensive no wonder you have critics what the hell <laughs> yes right? the, yeah the, it's it's very comprehensive. In a way, it's it's a history of the Roman Empire yeah. in the first century, because this was so intertwined with what Rome was doing. This is always the problem when you're reading the gospel story. Uh, you know, they, they've 
trapped it in a little tiny location in the middle of you know the eastern roman empire and it's all happening just around jerusalem well well no you know this was a much bigger story than just judea this was a big story of the whole of the roman empire how the roman empire was governed who was going to govern it so the whole point of this story was the ambitions of a royal family and that royal family turned out to be the Edessan royal family, but they, they came from Egypt, they went to Parthia, they were thrown out of Parthia, they ended up in Edessa, and initially I thought they were quite poor there because they'd been thrown out of the country, but it transpires that they came out of Parthia with half the Persian treasury, uh. so they weren't short of, you know, a few shekels. Uh, and using that money, they used it to gain influence in the whole of the east of the Roman Empire, to gain lands, to gain um, uh, influence in the kingdom of Judea and, and the whole of Levant and most of Syria. Uh, and then the final culmination of this growth of this, uh, the ambitions of this particular royal family was the empty throne in, Ju in, in uh, Rome. So, you know, Nero was dead in AD 68, the throne was empty, and it was empty for whoever could grab it. If you had a big enough army, if you had enough money, you could put your name out there and say, you know, I'm going to take over Rome. And this was the year of four emperors. Four emperors came and went and had a go at this and tried to become the next emperor, and they were all overthrown by the next one and then overthrown by the next one. And then we ended up with this enormous great battle in Judea, which I say had nothing to do with Judea at all. This was the battle, the final battle for the throne of Rome. And whoever was going to win this battle was going to become the next emperor. And that battle was between Vespasian, who was just a commander at that time, an army commander, and the king of Edessa. And whoever was going to win that particular war was going to become the next emperor. So they, they were going for high stakes here. And of course they lost. And that's why they ended up getting evicted and exiled and everything else. But that's the reason why this, because I say that the kings of Edessa, of course, were linked to the biblical Jesus story and Jesus himself. And that's why this guy was actually crucified wearing a crown of thorns and a purple cloak, because uh, the crown of thorns was the traditional crown of the Edessan monarchy, and the purple cloak was the symbol of the emperor of Rome, because that's what they wanted to actually achieve. Uh, and so it was mockery, basically. It was mockery of a pretender to the throne of Rome who had failed, and now he was going to get crucified. And that's the biblical story. So. It's a huge story yeah. that affects the whole of the Roman Empire. And that's why it was the Roman Empire that wrote this story. And they wrote it through the, um, uh, through the uh, cooperation, I suppose you might call it, of Josephus Flavius, who was the, you know, the poodle of uh, Emperor Vespasian. He was his uh, favorite pet Jew, and he wrote the whole history of this region. And so he was the guy who could craft this new story. And he was the guy who was effectively in charge of Judea. He was the de facto sort of um, king of Judea at that time, working for Vespasian. And as you say, he created the simple Judaism. Uh, what a concoction that is. There's a couple of thousand <laughs> years of yes. interviews. Uh, <laughs> he created, he's, he's literally St. Paul, isn't it? The, the author of the... Uh, Acts. Yeah, he is Saul himself. So Joseph yeah. is Saul. I said this like 25 years ago. Or yeah. more. Some people are coming around to this idea. There's still a lot of opposition to it. Um, but it does explain everything that happened in the gospel events. Um, not acceptable to fundamentalist Christians because uh, not because of what it does to Saul, but because nobody wants Joseph as Flavius as being the um, author of their religion. Mm. Um, and it also means that Jesus must have been alive in the 80s, 50s and 60s, which again is uh, unacceptable to Orthodox Christianity. But apart from that, it 
explains everything that happened in the gospel events. But is that where, in your personal career, the first blowback came? Uh, or was it over another issue uh, when, it, when it really f first started in earnest and you knew you had to, you know, uh, suit up to deal with these people? Was it over this Josephus thing or something else that they didn't like? Yeah, that was one of the big things. The two, uh, two or three big things that people don't like about this thesis is uh, uh, Saul being Josephus. Merely because they say it's impossible, but it's not impossible. All you need to know is that uh, uh, Saul went on his first uh, missionary tour of, of the Mediterranean aged 15. And of course, he was a man at that time because he had already been through his bar mitzvah. Um, the second main thing that people don't like is that uh, my Jesus character turns into a real king. That's right. Which they deny, which is very strange because, you know, Jesus was born as a king and he was only crucified because they say he claimed he was a king. And then they say, oh, no, he wasn't a king. He was just a carpenter. But yeah. the Gospels say he was a king on 36 occasions. So why not, you know, believe the Gospels? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opposition to that, even though the Gospels do say he was a king. They say, oh, no, he was just a pretend king. He's not a real king. And they don't want him to be a king because now he becomes powerful. He's no longer a carpenter. So he's now no longer the um, downtrodden uh, pauper. Uh, you know, at the mercy of all these powerful people, and he's just a, you know, a poor man, you know, with a message. Suddenly he becomes a very powerful person with a message again. Um, but he was uh, a warrior king, so he was very powerful. He was involved in a war with the, um, uh, with the Romans. That's not the story they want to sell. That's not the story they've sold for the last 2,000 years. Uh, and so that brings a lot of um, opposition to it. They don't like that change in the story. Um, what else don't they like? Um, well, yeah, they don't like him in being involved in a war. But that's strange, because if you read the Gospels, he was involved with a war. I mean, he was jailed alongside revolutionaries who had committed murder in the revolution. Okay, so yeah. what revolution was that? It was the Jewish revolt. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, in the Christian uh, world, they don't want to acknowledge that, that um, Jesus could ever have been a powerful king. And they, they hinted at it by having at least one of his disciples be a Sikari or a Zealot. I don't remember which one. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, um, Judas Iscariot was oh. a Sikari. There you are. And then, of course, one of his uh, other disciples was a, um, a zealot, um, Simon Zelotes. The zealots were the um, initiators of the revolt. The Sicarii were the, um, uh, the assassins that used to go around with a small knife and uh, assassinate their um, opposition. Uh, they used to hide the, this knife under their cloaks. And then in the crowds, they used to kill one of their opposition uh, people and mm. melt into the crowds once more yeah uh, that was yeah. judas iscariot um yeah it's all to do with a revolt it's all to do with a um takeover of jerusalem but if, even when if you understand that and accept that it had nothing to do with jerusalem and this is uh, the second thing that they won't accept that this had nothing to do with with Judea. This was, you know, Judea was just a stepping stone that they wanted to take over the Roman Empire. That was the goal. That's why he was crucified wearing a purple cloak, which was mm. the symbol of the emperor. Uh, it, it really mm. had nothing to do with uh, Judea, except that to control the east of the empire was a very powerful position because right. uh, Syria at that time was perhaps the richest part of the Roman Empire. It's not sure. today because it's had a thousand years of Islam, but, um, you know, in those days, uh, the big temples of, of the Roman Empire were in Syria. You know, you look at Baalbek, which was the biggest temple ever created in the Roman Empire. It's vast. You know, it had mm. pillars that were 2.4 meters across at the base. I mean, these are vast, vast pillars. Mm. Um, if you look at Palmyra, it had the biggest 
temple arena in the whole of the Roman Empire. And okay, it wasn't as big as Baalbek, but the, um, the, the pillars <coughs> were unfinished and they were unfinished because the capitals were made of bronze. I mean, that was stupendously expensive to put bronze capitals on the top of these pillars. Um, they've all gone now, of course, because they, they were all looted, but um, it must have been the most expensive temple in the whole of the Roman Empire. So yeah. we're not talking about a backwater, which we always think of this, you know, that Jesus was born in some backwater of the Roman Empire. No, this was central to the Roman Empire. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it was the richest part of the empire, and it became so influential that 200 years later, 150 years later in the early third century, the emperors of Rome came from Syria. You look at the Severans, you look at Elagabalus, uh, and we're going back to the uh, Holy Grail stone, stone as well. It was Elagabalus who took the Holy Grail stone from Syria. This is why I was saying that um, the Holy Grail was something to do with Edessa, because this sacred stone came back from Parthia and ended up in Edessa. And I think that's one of the reasons why Edessa became so important. They had managed to capture one of the uh, central elements of Judaism. They had the Ark of the Covenant in the first century. Mm. And we have coins. We, we know this because there are, well, there's an inscription uh, in their, um, uh, their, their burial site, uh, but also they have coins. And the coins show the Ark of the Covenant in a temple. And it's known as a Bethel, which is the Omphala stone, uh, because it's a house of God, but it's only a small house of God. So it's a, the Ark of the Covenant was the box that contained the sacred stone. And the sacred stone was the, one of the stones of God, and therefore it was a house of God. It was a Bethel. It yeah. was a um, on the phallus. And because it was that shape, mm. when you look, people see it every day on cathedral buildings, capital buildings, in fact, they may have a Donatello, like a dome, and then a little tiny little house at the top, little dome. People think, oh, what's that? Yeah. So you see it in these spires, you see it in the domes of the most famous buildings in the world. Little do they know that it's a magnification of this whole concept. See, the thing I like about your work is that um, we have a lot of stuff in the foreground that everybody from childhood knows about Jesus and the 12 disciples and the crucifixion. And not many people know the history of Judaism, which would then be you know, the middle ground and the background. Uh, and then, or the background would really be Egypt, Atnas, Egypt, uh, mon the origins of monotheism, etc. And so the difficulties come because everyone is so focused either on the, the foreground, which is the general public, or some historian who's just got this whole background view about the Egypts and you know, all of that. What your work does is it brings the lot together in which we get a far more vivid picture. We have the background. I think you're one of the best writers ever. In fact, I know it because I've read everybody else. And as great as your Eisenmans are and your Barber theories and you know, whoever you might want to talk about, uh, you know, there's less cohesion in their work because they tunnel vision on a particular point and then have just complete cognitive breakdown if they have to move one step out from what their speciality is to think about it in terms of the, of the greater world. And you, you don't seem to have any such uh, rigidity there. It, that's why it flows. And, you know, so somebody who's coming in yeah. interested in Roman Empire, somebody's coming in with history of the Jews, somebody's coming in with, you know, Akhenaten and that. And by the way, just as many critics as you have, there are other writers that I recommend people go to, like Professor Feather, uh, uh, you know, like the Copper Scroll, a great book. There's corroboration out there. Whether those writers are knowing your work or not is at this point. Not the, not, the, not the point to make, but their works, if people spend the time to read them, my God, that work, that man's work and many others is totally parallels what you're saying. And so I would imagine that a lot of your critics actually are not as widely read perhaps as they you know, claim to be. I, I think a lot of them are constrained by their own belief systems, whether they understand that or not. not. So you get people like uh, Professor Robert Eisenman, who is great, you know, he's wonderful read his books, he's so full of information, but he's still constrained by his Judaic belief systems. And it's very difficult for people like that to go outside the yeah. constraints of their belief system, Judaism yeah. in this case. So, I mean, 
Eisenman, for instance, proved that Mary Bothus was Mary Magdalene. Oh, I thought that was wonderful. So I actually called him because I had his uh, address and I said, well, brilliant, well done. And he said, no, 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 you misunderstand. Um, they're not the same person, but they just based the history of Mary Magdalene upon Mary Bothus. Um, that's why she looks like she's the same woman. Hmm. The reason he said that is because he could not allow Mary Magdalene to be an AD 60s character. He was still wedded to the idea that she had to be an AD 30s character, AD 20s character, and he could not bring her into the AD 60s. And that's why he had to say that it was just a, a new persona that was based upon Mary Bothus. Mm. Um, so yeah, people get constrained by their beliefs. And I've seen this so many times, people that even shouldn't, who profess to be independent, people like um, uh, Ehrman. I was very disappointed when I read, yeah, read Bart, his, his Bart, yeah, Bart Ehrman, um, because yeah. he professes to be atheistic, I think, or something of that nature, agnostic, I don't know what. But again, he came through seminary school. Yeah. And it rubs off in his books. If you read his books, he's not really wanting to go outside the constraints of Christianity because of his earlier upbringing uh, within Christianity. And of course, mm. I don't have that problem. And one of the big things, of course, within Judaism and Christianity, I suppose, that they won't acknowledge is their links back into Egypt. Yeah. And yeah, the, the, the battles I've had on trying to say that the uh, Israelites were the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. Is, is oh, that's another one. Amazing. Yeah, this is another one, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah, so when I asked you earlier about which are the sticking points for people, that would certainly be one. And yet, <laughs> Sigmund Freud. One, yes. Yeah, but there's many a, a great theorist before who worked on the Moses Akhenaten thing and yeah. the Hyksos yeah. uh, yeah. uh, Velikovsky. There's there's plenty. And by the way, just as a case in point. When I mentioned the corroboratory, if people go to my astrotheologyzone.com, by and large, every book that I put there is a corroboration of your work, by and large, not, not maybe in 100%. But that, if people really want to follow that up, or your critics who just kind of step past a lot of things, you know, go visit that site. And, and there's Bart Ehrman uh, things there, but there's Robert Graves and you know, Albert Churchward, mm -hmm. some really fantastic writers who will confirm in their own idiom, you know, a great many things that you have done in a modern era since the mid nineties, uh, you know, you pick up a lot of it is picked up from what these people said in the past, but they didn't have actual as much, you know, evidence or whatever you want to call it just by the, simply the movement of time. And again, they were fighting the institutions as well as you are. Um, yeah. Yeah. Shall we bring our host back in esoteric? I'm going to have to get going. So did you have any points or questions you want to ask? because we're going to have you on the show on Unslaved. Ralph, we're going to have back for, for the Grail Cipher continuation, oh. because as we said, touched on earlier, there is a tremendous connection here to the heart of British mythology and history in terms of the Arthurian legend. Ralph's latest work shows a new, totally new complexion on that. And that's where a lot of astrotheology is involved as well. Uh, everybody who heard about the round table yeah, it wouldn't have taken a rocket scientist to go, mm, is that zodiacal with the different knights and what have you? So so even approaching it from that point of view, there is something there. Yes, there's even been temples with zodiacs found in England in places like Cheshire. So if this is new to people, check out Ralph's work as YouTube channel, brush up on that. And we have several interviews on Enslaved that again, go in depth into this. But mm. Esoteric, are, are you there? Are you joining us again? Yeah, I'm here, I'm listening and I'm learning. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, my machine won't last much longer without being restarted. So what do you think? Are we terminated soon? Gents, thank you. Thank you for your time. I uh, definitely would like to have you both back on again. Yeah. And it's been a huge learning experience for me. And I hope the viewers will feel the same way. Yeah, thanks for letting us have this chat on your show, Esoterica. Yeah. It's uh, great to see you again. Thank you, gents.